Hello, good morning and good day to you, people of God. This is Agape FM, bringing the gospel nearer to you. And it is a beautiful Thursday morning in Port Elizabeth today. The sky is blue, the sun is shining, and hopefully there'll be a bit of a breeze that will build up and cool us down. And whoever you are, and wherever you are this morning, a very warm welcome to you. May the Lord bless you as we go through his word together. And may the Holy Spirit instruct us and teach us as we hear the word together today. And before I go any further, let me remind you that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is absolutely wonderful. And let's put another nugget into our pockets this morning and the verse that I'd like to draw your attention to this morning is the last part of Galatians 5 verse 1 and this is what it says it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free now if we think about that today people isn't that absolutely wonderful that Jesus Christ has paid the price and all it was about in every area that we can imagine was that we can be free, free from sin, free from death, free from an eternal life other than with the Lord in hell, free in our spirit, free in our soul, free in our body, free in our circumstances, free in our thinking free in our heart. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And through Calvary, what Jesus did is he paved the way that we could be reconciled to Father God, and that has given us freedom. You know, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, God banished them from the garden, and God set two angels to stand at the garden so that no one else was allowed to enter. And that's what happened. That's what the Bible teaches us. But you know, through Calvary, Jesus Christ has opened up the way for us to enter the garden again. We can enter in, in freedom because it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we know the word of God says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain help and find grace to help in time of need. And you see, we can freely come to God. We don't have to pay a price when we even approach the Father. But God says, come boldly, come boldly before me with your requests. So we thank Jesus that he has given us an eternal hope, that we are free to enjoy an eternal hope with him, and that we do not have to go through eternal damnation. So let's remind ourselves again, Galatians 5 verse 1, in the latter part of the verse, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And my God, may we embrace this freedom in every single way. Father, help us to embrace this freedom that Jesus has given us, that we may put this freedom on as a cloak and wear it with humility, for Jesus has paid a high price for our freedom. And so listeners this morning, what we want to do is get straight into our topic. And it is now 10.03 a.m. And let's get in to our topic. And our topic this morning, I've simply entitled Digging Deep. All right. Now, immediately, if I say the words digging deep, Perhaps you have a picture or something in your mind's eye that you just see someone digging a big hole and just digging, digging, digging. Perhaps you yourself have had to dig a hole or dig something out in the garden and it seemed like it has gone on forever, but you knew for whatever reason there was that it had to be deep. And when you thought that you were deep enough, perhaps you realized you had to go a bit deeper. And so if I say digging deep, perhaps that's the kind of image that comes across your mind. And so today, when I talk about digging deep, I'm talking about spiritual digging and spiritual deepness. Okay, so let's understand this right from the start. Digging deep 
But digging how? Digging what? It is spiritual digging for spiritual deepness. And the scripture we're going to use this morning, if you'd like to write it down or would like to turn there in your Bible, is Luke 5 verses 4 to 6. All right. And I'm going to read that to you. Let's have a look at verse 5, and we're going to read from verses 4 to 6. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and the net broke. All right, so here we have just a few verses where the disciples had been fishing, well, some of the disciples had been fishing all night, and they had caught nothing. But Jesus comes along, and he's busy, he's teaching, and what he does is he looks at them, and he says, go a little bit deeper. So in a nutshell, Jesus is saying, go out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon still argues with him and says, but we've been here all night and we have caught nothing, but let me do what you have said. And so they take the boat into deeper water and they let down their nets. And there the word of God says they catch a full load of fish so that their nets broke. Okay, we're going to just look at this and we need to see, just we're going to take out a few words from this where Jesus said to them, go out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. When Jesus said to them, go, he was referring, you go, right? No one else could go. They were in the boat. They were the ones who were fishing. And so when he said go, he was instructing them, you go. I can't go for you. You go. You take the boat into deeper water. And that's the next word that we would like to look at this morning, is that Jesus said, take the boat, go into the deep. Now the deep portrays kind of like an unknown place, something that is not known. It could even portray something scary, but probably something that we could also use the term that hadn't been known before. So not necessarily scary, but just something that was unusual or a place that had never been known or gone to before in this circumstance. So he says, go out, you go, you take the boat into the deep and unknown place and you let down your nets. Now we have to look at the symbolism of nets this morning. And what we're going to look at is, and it is obvious and we need to realize that nets, if we are going to catch something, nets always will symbolize our faith. Very often, most times, they will symbolize our faith. So the disciples know Simon hears Jesus say, you go, take the boat into the unknown, into the deep water, and let down your faith. Put your faith down. Trust me. Use your faith. Implement your faith. Practice your faith. For what? For a catch. Okay. So whatever we are going to catch from God, whatever we are fishing for, we need to remember that we have to use our own faith, that we have to practice the faith that we have. And so if I may ask you a few questions right now, let me say this to you. What right now do you want to catch from God? Or what over the past weeks or months months or even possibly years have you been trying to catch 
from God. What is it? And I'm sure as you sit there and you hear this question this morning, perhaps many, many things are coming across your mind and you can think of quite a few things and maybe you could even write down a whole list. Maybe just one thing comes to mind. But what is it that over the past time up until now or even today that you have been wanting to catch from God? What are you after? Okay, how long? Have you been chasing this particular thing? How long have you been throwing down your net and catching nothing and getting nowhere, toiling all night, symbolic of perseverance and getting nowhere? Perhaps you trust in God for a certain anointing or a certain ministry. Perhaps you trust in God this morning for a physical need or a circumstantial need. Perhaps this morning you've been trying to catch a financial blessing or some kind of breakthrough in your life in an area that you need breakthrough. Perhaps you're really just after a deeper relationship with Jesus. And if that be the case, let me say this, you are on the right path. For today, we are speaking about digging deep, spiritual digging for spiritual deepness. All right, I want to go to Genesis 32, verse 26. And here we have a story, and if you would like to go and read Genesis 32, please do that. But we're going to just draw out the one verse. And here we have Jacob. And Jacob is lying at night, and he's looking up at the stars. And God comes to meet Joseph through the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph, and so begins his encounter with God that night. And Jacob begins to wrestle with the angel of the Lord, and they wrestle through the night. And what Jacob says to the angel of the Lord, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. So that is Genesis 32 verse 26. And we know that in the Old Testament that every time the angel of the Lord is mentioned, it is a theophany. And what a theophany is, is an appearance of Jesus Christ. So there we have that Jacob was wrestling with the angel of the Lord and said, I won't let you go. I will wrestle to keep hold of you until you bless me. And this showed great perseverance on the part of Jacob. But Jacob knew what he was after. Jacob knew that he wanted and he needed God's blessing. And so he wasn't willing to let the angel of the Lord go. He wasn't willing to let Jesus go. He knew in his heart, I will hold on to this angel of the Lord. I will cling to him because he does have a blessing for me. He will have a blessing for me and I am going to make sure that I get this blessing. And so you can go and read how it ended. We're not going to go into that today, but you can go and read and see in Genesis 32 what happened to Jacob as he would not let go of the angel of the Lord, as in his heart and in his spirit he dug deep all night long, toiling and wrestling with the angel of the Lord, saying, I'm not letting you go. You're not leaving me here without blessing me. Now, we need to come to something important, and I need to say this to you. We do not need to wrestle God for anything anymore. Everything has been given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, through Calvary. You see, what happened was that on the cross, Jesus wrestled with God. He wrestled with the weight of the sin the weight of the world, the sin that was on his shoulders, that put him on the cross for you and for me. Through his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, Jesus paid the price. Jesus has done the wrestling for us. So we do not have to wrestle with God like Jacob wrestled 
with the angel of the Lord. But what we learn from this, and I just want to say about that, isn't that fantastic? That we don't have to wrestle God for our blessings, but that our blessings are already ours through Jesus. Because God's word says to us that it is through Jesus that we are blessed and made righteous. So we have all the benefits. We have the blessings that God offers us through covenant, through his son, Jesus Christ. So now we don't have to come and say, God, well, tonight I've got to wrestle you for this that I want or need from you. Jesus has done the wrestling for us. But the lesson we learn is that we also, like Jacob, there will be times that we also have to persevere and say, God, I'm not letting go of you because I'm able to take hold of you through grace, through Jesus, through Calvary, and I will keep a hold of you. And I will thank you and trust you for your blessings and for the catch that you have for me. And God, I will let down my nets. I will exercise my faith and trust you to catch what I'm trusting you for. And God, me, myself, I will take my boat and I will go into deeper waters in faith. Okay, let's move on. And let's just say we can really just look at the whole thing as if we want to put another terminology to it, pressing in. There we are. You know, sometimes we will have to press in. And I'm sure many of you listening this morning and who will still listen, that you know about pressing in. You see, God comes our way and he has made everything available. So now we don't need to wrestle him and say, well, God, I'm wrestling you for this and hopefully I'm going to win and then that'll be mine. Jesus has done that for us. But there may be times where God says, all right, Pressing a little bit. Yes, Jesus has paid the price for you. Yes, it is yours. But just press in a little bit. So we will find that there will be times that we will have to press in. Okay, so let's just go back to the disciples on the boat. And let's just re-emphasize that they didn't catch anything until they moved. All right, so what happened was Simon heard the word, he heard what Jesus said, and he obeyed. So here we have, we have hearing and obedience. And we need to realize that hearing and obedience go together. So hearing what? Hearing the word of God. And we know the Bible says to us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if you want to let down your nets, and I did say to you that that's your faith, exercise your faith for the catch that you want, and you think, well, I don't know what kind of faith do I have, God. Possibly my faith needs to grow. One of the ways that our faith will grow and does grow and can grow is through hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. So we need to get involved in the word of God. We need to read it out loud that our physical ears can hear God's word, but we need to read his word so that our spiritual ears can hear his word. And there we have hearing and faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. So Simon heard the word of Jesus and he obeyed. And so we need to make up our minds Will we obey God's word? You see, we do need and we do want to catch whatever it is we want to catch. We do want a catch from God. We want a catch so big that our nets break, that our faith is extended so far beyond where we think it can go for all the things that we need and perhaps would like and that we are trusting God for in whatever way or area that is and we want to catch. Well, you would be the same as me, and I would be the same as everybody else who's trusting God for a catch. But we've got to hear God's word, and we have to obey. So we have to move our boat. We have to go into deeper waters. We have to learn how to dig deep, how to press in spiritual digging for spiritual deepness. 
Now, let me come on to this point, and this is what I've just mentioned a few minutes ago, where we talked about pressing in. God's timing plays a large factor. God's timing is absolutely everything. And very often, we try and run ahead of God's timing. We know what God has said, and well, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And people say, well, didn't God say that to you? And we think, you know, actually, God, you did say that to me, and you said it more than once, and what's going on? God, I feel a fool, because I've told everybody what you've said, and it still hasn't happened. And so then we begin to feel, oh, maybe I'm missing something, because yes, God said it. God said it so many times, and it actually ha hasn't happened. And perhaps doubt comes in and we begin to question, did God really say that? Or we do the opposite, which is we try and force it to happen. And so because everyone's putting pressure on us or perhaps we are putting pressure on ourselves, we think, well, yes, God did say that. All right, well, let me make that happen myself. That is not faith. That is fear. And let me say this, the timing of the Lord is perfect. And very often God will say something and he'll say it more than once and he will show it in different ways. He can confirm it through various means, different ways, and it doesn't mean it will happen immediately. What it means is that we will still need to press in, in trusting God for this. It can take a month, it can take a year, it can take five years or ten years, but we cannot run ahead of the Lord and make it happen ourselves. So God's timing in our Christian life, we need to learn that God's timing is perfect. And we need to realize that Simon and whoever else was with him in the boat, they had been fishing all night. They had been toiling all night and nothing had happened. But when Jesus arrived, when Jesus spoke and they obeyed, there the miracle happened. So we learn from that, that they had to wait for Jesus to get there. And when he did, and when he spoke, and faith was coupled together with obedience, there the miracle happened. And so let me encourage you that if you are waiting for something, and you're wondering, and you're saying, God, you said this, you promised that, God, it's been a long time, and I don't see it. Don't give up. Continue to dig deep. Continue to press in. Continue to exercise your faith. Continue to trust God. Go into the deep. Let down your nets of faith and trust God to bring that miracle. We need to realize that we can't move spiritually until we are ready to move in the soul, or ready to move emotionally or mentally. And you know, so often that is the reason why we do have to wait, because God knows us, God sees us, He sees our heart, He sees our soul, He sees our circumstances, He sees and He knows everything. And very often God knows and He says, you know, I've promised Diane this, I have given my word a few times. I've shown her this, I've shown her that. But I see that she's not quite ready at the moment. So my timing will be perfect because when I do bring it to pass, then she will be ready. And so we need to remember so often that we need to look after our souls. We know that the word of God says to us that Paul writes and he says, Beloved, I wish my hope is that you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And we know from that that God is pointing us to us and he's saying, do you want to prosper? Do you want to prosper in any and every area of your life? Well, the way for breakthrough, the way for prosperity is that you prosper on the inside, in your soul in your mental faculties, in your mind, in your thinking, in your heart, in your spirit. And we need to remember that when God talks about prosperity, God is not talking about financial prosperity only. It is probably the last form of prosperity that God is talking about. What God is talking about is on our inside. Because it doesn't matter what happens on the outside if we are sick 
on the inside. No matter, for example, even if we had financial prosperity, it would mean nothing because only Jesus can give us true peace, true joy, true contentment, true fulfillment. Remember, we started out and we spoke about Galatians 5 verse 1. Only Jesus has set us free for us to be free indeed. And when God says, do you know, I want you to prosper in your soul so that your whole life can prosper, it is to enjoy the freedom that Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done for us through Calvary. And our circumstances and our finances are the very bottom of the page. All right, let's move a little bit on. Let me give you an example, if I can do that. Many years ago, I was living up north and I thought to myself, I'm going to move back to Port Elizabeth, which I eventually did. And here I am in Port Elizabeth today. And what happened was at the first time that I thought I'm going to move back to Port Elizabeth, I went to church one Sunday morning and uh, nobody knew that I was thinking this. And a lady stood up in the service and she had this word of wisdom. And she said, somebody here is planning to move, but God says to you, don't do it. And I said, well, God, that's me. I have asked you to help me to hear from you whether I should do this or not. And I took that to be from God. And so I didn't move. I did nothing about it. And then many years later, I had the same thought. And I'm talking about probably 10 years later. And I thought, okay, it's time now. And God spoke again. And God was very clear. And he said, no. But four years after that, God said to me, okay, now it's time for you to physically move from where you are living back to Port Elizabeth. So I had those ideas in advance, long in advance, that that was coming. But twice God stopped me. And then there came a point when he said, okay, now is the time. And there we have to realize that God knows what is best for us. God's timing is absolutely perfect. Trust God for his timing. You see, on twice that I tried to come back to PE, I ran ahead of God and it didn't work out. And God had to stop me. And so let me say again, we must press in. We must dig deep spiritually for spiritual blessings. And one of those blessings is to also hear God's voice. You see, as we go through life, we need to hear God's voice. We need his guidance every day. We need him to say, do this, do that, turn left, turn right. We need that. Because if we are left to our own devices, if we are left to make our own decisions all the time, we would make a mess. We do need the guidance and direction of the Lord. And so we also need to dig deep so that we hear his voice in a clearer way and that we hear his voice more often than we do or that sometimes we hear God's voice and we don't even realize we hear God's voice. But we need to start realizing, my goodness, God, that was your voice. And we need to learn how to recognize the voice of of God. So spiritual moving must be done at the point of revelation or at the point of God speaking. Now I've just given you an example where God spoke to me literally and he said, okay, now it is time for you to move. But in the spirit, to move spiritually, to go into the deep, to go into the deep waters, an unknown place perhaps, needs to come through the revelation of hearing God's word. That's why it's so important to be tuned into God to hear his word. That's why it's so important to go with God's timing and not run ahead of him. That's why it's so important to read God's word and to give him every opportunity to speak to us and to minister to us. You see, Simon didn't move the boat into deeper waters until Jesus spoke. And when Jesus speaks, that is the point 
of revelation. You see, the spoken word is the rhema word, which is the revelation. So when God speaks, when that revelation comes, that's when we take the boat into deeper waters. And that's when we begin to dig deep like we have never before. Revelation is the rhema word. That is the changing word. That is the word that brings change. So you see the twice that I tried to move back to PE, God stopped me and said, no, not now. But when the third time came along and God said, yes, this is the time, that brought the change because that was the spoken word, the rhema word, the revelational word that brought the change. In my case, a literal change because I literally moved towns. Now we have to apply this in the spiritual realm. All right. So revelation is changing. So we need to listen to God. We need to hear God for that word because when that word comes, it will be life changing in every way. Okay. So we need to ask God as we read his word and as we pray and spend time with him that he would open our spiritual eyes and that he would open our spiritual ears that we may hear what he says and see in our spirit what he shows us so that we may grasp that revelation when that revelation comes. And so let's remember that, you know, when we spend our time with God or even just on a, on a daily basis that we say, Father, help me. Today that I will be so in tune that my spiritual eyes and ears will be open, that I will hear your voice and I will see what you show me so that I may have that revelation word because that will bring the change. Moving is a change. So when we move spiritually, we will have spiritual change. And that is obedience when Jesus has spoken. So moving and spiritual change and obedience and that revelation word, which is the word when Jesus speaks, they all work together. They all work hand in hand. If we want to move spiritually, we need to be prepared to change. If we want change in our lives, we need to be prepared to move spiritually. So they go together just like that. Okay, so God, I want change in my life. So Jesus says, do you want to catch fish? You want change? You take the boat into deeper waters. You move spiritually. You exercise your faith and see what I will do for you. And so we say, God, I want a big catch here. God, I want a big catch I've been pressing in and I've caught nothing and I want a big catch. And Jesus will come and say, okay, make a change. So spiritual catches or spiritual blessings or spiritual moving means change. But change, if we want change, means spiritual moving. So they are two sides of the same coin and I hope that you understand that. So they moved, the disciples moved to a deeper spot and they took their boat out. Now let me go back to a question that I've asked you a few minutes ago and let me remind you and say this, what do you want from God? What is it that you are after? What change is it that you are after? Are you prepared to move spiritually for this change. And to move spiritually, you will have to change. Okay, and we're going to look at that a little bit later. You will have to move into a deeper spot to catch what you want. You know, sometimes we need to just do a little bit of an internal examination and we need to say to God, God, I do want to move spiritually, but I realize I've got to change. And so what kind of changes can you make? Well, this is the time, which is a good time to say, all right, let me have an internal examination and let me see 
not just internally on the inside, but also on the outside through my habits or my circumstances or my processes. How can I change? And we can ask ourselves the questions, am I serious about change? Am I like Jacob, who was prepared to wrestle with the angel of the Lord? Am I prepared to press in and to dig deep? I don't have to wrestle with God anymore, but am I prepared to wait for his timing? Am I ready? Am I serious for the change that I want? Am I open to what God might say to me? Because Simon didn't know what Jesus would say to him. And Jesus then spoke and said, take your boat out into the deep and let down your nets. Are we open to what Jesus might say? Will we be willing to obey what he might say. So do we really want change? You see, we do need to do a bit of a stock take of our heart and find out, all right, I want to move spiritually. I want to dig deep, God, but I realize I've got to make some changes. It can be through, like I said, our daily habits or just whatever it may be. And the question is, are you willing to make those changes? Because when we are willing to make the changes that the Lord points out to us and that God recommends, then we will move spiritually and go to a deeper spiritual place. And we need to be open to let God work with us. You see, when we do an examination of the heart, we need to look at those internal things that we know are there and perhaps have, have been there for quite a while, those things that perhaps don't please God and aren't pleasing to the Lord and perhaps don't align with his word. We need to be prepared to let God help us, which means we have to be open and honest before the Father and say, God, there are these few things that I can see in this area that I need to change. Are you willing to let God work with you? Because that'll mean that you will have to do what he says. If it is forgive, you're going to have to forgive. If it is to just embrace some joy and peace, you're going to have to stop being miserable and start embracing some joy and peace. If it means that you need to be a little bit kinder and show God's heart and have compassion and patience, then that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to let go of your impatience and of your anger. And I can go on with so many different examples this morning, but by now, I think you realize what you will have to do. You will have to let God work with your soul. You will have to let God work with your thinking processes in your mind. You know, so often we are proud in our thoughts. So often we have self-pity in our thoughts. So often we just are contrary in our thoughts. And that's not God's heart. And we may very often in our own thoughts, we are right in our own sight and we just want to do what we want to do and what we think is best for us. And God might need us to change our thought processes, the way that we think. Perhaps we're negative and God will say, well, you need to do this. You need to pull out that negativity from the root and get it right out of you. God might need to work in our mind, in our soul, so that our soul can prosper. So are you serious enough that you are willing enough to let God work inside you and sort those things out that may need a change? That is the question for you. You know, emotionally, very often, we have things from the past that bother us, or things that perhaps we haven't dealt with. These are typical things that sit in the soul that perhaps we call baggage, which just means that these are things that we've been dragging around for so long. And one thing we know is that baggage weighs us down. We know that God's word says in more than one place, let the past go. We know that Paul writes and he says, this one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind me and looking forward to that which lies ahead. And so are you serious? Will you let God work with you? Will you work with God? Will you make the changes that you need to make so that you can move spiritually into a deeper place so that you can catch 
what you are wanting to catch from God, what you have been trying to catch from God for perhaps a period of time. You know, perhaps you are digging deep, like I said earlier on, for an anointing from God or a ministry from God that you would like to see materialize in your life, that you would like God to use you in a certain way, and perhaps it's just never come across your path, and there's ne never been opportunity, and that is what you want from the Lord. And, you know, we need to remember that even for things like that, you know, so often many Christians are digging deep and they want to catch spiritual blessings. Not everybody wants to catch spirit, uh, physical things from God or material things from God or circumstantial things from God. Many times Christians also want to catch spiritual things from God, and that's wonderful. And we should always want to catch spiritual things. We should always want to see God use us in new ways and fresh ways and different ways and open the door for that in our lives and create opportunities for us. And let's just look at an example of Elijah and Elisha, my two favorite prophets. Now, Elijah passed the mantle on to Elisha. Okay, and you can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 2. And there came a time where God was going to take Elijah, the oldest one. And God said to him, okay, you are going to anoint Elisha in your place, go and do it, which is what Elijah did. And so Elisha spent a time with Elijah before God came to take Elijah. And on a time or on a day that God was going to come and take Elijah, Elisha, being a prophet himself, also knew, today God is going to take my master. Elijah knew, and Elisha knew, and all the prophets in the area knew. And they traveled around, and Elijah said to Elisha, because he knew God was coming to take him, he said, stay here. And Elisha said, no, I will not leave you, because he wanted something from Elijah, and he knew God was coming to take him. And so he followed Elijah from one place to the next. And there were four places. Okay, we have Gilgal, we have Bethel, we have Jericho, and we have Jordan. And Elijah went from place to place. And each place he got to, Elisha followed him. And at every place, Elijah said to Elisha, don't come with me any further, stay here. And Elisha said, no, I will not leave you this day. And he followed him to the next place. And at every place, the other prophets in the area all came out and they all said to Elisha, God is going to take your master today. And Elisha said, yes, I know. You see, we must remember that God tells the prophets everything, everything that he wants them to know. So they know things that other people don't ordinarily know. So Elisha refused even though the other prophets all came and said to him, in each of the four destinations, God is taking your master today. Elisha said, I will not leave you, Elijah. And he followed him eventually to the Jordan River. That was the last port of call. And that is where God came to take Elijah. And if you go and read 2 Kings chapter 2, you will see, we're not talking about that today, but you will see that Elisha got what he wanted from Elijah. That is a whole different um, teaching or a topic to talk about in itself, and we're not going to look at that today. But what we do see, we see that Elisha dug deep, that he refused to stay where Elijah wanted him to stay, that as Elijah moved, he moved with him and would not stay behind. He pressed in until God came to take Elijah and he got what he wanted. And Elijah didn't die. He is one of two people in the Bible that we know that God tells us about, that God took them without dying. Elijah was one of them, the prophet Elijah, a major prophet, and we know that God sent horse, horses and chariot for him to get into, which he did. He got into it, God and, took, and God took him up to heaven. And we know the other man was Enoch, and the word of God says, Enoch walked with God, and he was no more, for God took him. So God just took him, just like that. And so we know those two men that the Bible tells us about, God took. But we learn the lesson from Elisha that he would not stop. 
He dug deep. He dug his heels in. He went from place to place to get what he was after. All right, Elisha wouldn't let Elijah go. And so over the years, let me just share with you that so many, many times, God has often said to me, how serious are you? How hungry are you for what you want from me? For the spiritual things that you want from me? For the spiritual deepness that you want from me? How hungry are you? How desperate are you? Many times has God sent that to me and many times I've had to really sit and examine my heart to determine how serious and how desperate I have been for the things that I've wanted to catch in my net. It took Elisha time, it took him effort, and he had to wait for the perfect timing. And we've spoken about all of that. We've gone through that this morning. So how do we dig deep? You see, in the spirit, how do we take a spade and just dig deep? And dig a big hole and say, well, now I'm going to dig deep spiritually. How do we do that? Well, the first thing I want to say to you is we need to find a way. We need to find a way. We need to ask God for his help, for his wisdom. We need to learn from others. We need to keep our ears open and glean what we can from those who have been digging deep before us and for longer than us. We need to take on the tips and advice. And there are so many tips and advice out there. That's godly tips, godly advice. We need to know God's word, but we need to find a way to dig deep to dig deep for those spiritual blessings, for what we want to catch, to go into the deep waters and let down our nets of faith, we have to find a way. You know, I want to give you an example. And this is just a simple example. And this is not all I'm talking about. But I thought it was an example. Many, many years ago, I spent a time with a friend. And for five years, every weekday, Monday to Friday, at 12 o'clock, we went to the church to pray together. And while we went to the church, it was just, it was open. It was a common place that we could both meet. And we would go and pray inside the church for an hour, for five years, every Monday to Friday. We were serious. And over those years, there were so many things that we brought before the Lord. I don't even remember some of them. But I do remember a few of them. And all I can say is that in all those things, every single one of those things has come to pass in my life. But you know, just in this example, it took five years of every day on a weekday for an hour a day meeting up with a prayer partner and being serious and praying that's digging deep so that's just one example there are so many more we can find our own ways to dig deep but we need to find a way we need to be available you know, I've shared this with you, I think, a few times before. I've spent years, I've spent my Christian life, and that's been since a small girl, always I will pray for someone. If I'm called, even to people whom I don't know, and it's on behalf of someone else who I do know, and they say, please go there. I've prayed for people in the shops, in their homes, in the hospitals, in prayer lines, in services, in the church. I've always prayed for people. People who have come forward and said, look, I'm trusting God for this and whatever it may be. We can be available to those that say, I'm trusting God, but I need a little bit of help. Can you help me? Will you stand with me? Will you pray with me? Will you pray for me? We can do that. We can always do that. Okay, we can persevere. We can fast. Sometimes we can say, God, you know, I just feel that I'd like to do a little bit of fasting. And while I'm fasting, God, I'm trusting you that I will hear your voice. And I will learn how to dig deeper. And that while I'm fasting, God, I will dig deeper and hear from you. And know that I have victory over my enemies because we know that fasting we want to hear from God but also it is to have victory over our enemy the devil okay one key
that we need in digging deep is we need passion. So we need that desire in our heart. God, I want to do this. We need to laugh, dance, sing, shout. And that is in the spirit on the inside. It will come out on the outside. But that's passion, to just be so excited for the Lord. We need to loosen up a little bit. You know, do a little bit of a jig when the music's on and we're just praising and worshiping the Lord. Even in church, do a little bit of a dance and just have some passion. All right. Will you just excuse me? <coughs> Please excuse me for that. You know, years ago, a cousin and I used to pray together. And what we used to do is, well, we would always be in a quiet place. Actually, sometimes we would be in the backyard. So let me not say we were always in a secluded or quiet place. And we used to have this, I don't want to say a habit, but we used to do this every time we pray together, but we enjoyed doing this. And we had reason for this. It was just to be joyful and just to praise God. And when we used to pray together, we used to shout at the top of our voices over and over a few times the name of Jesus. And you know what joy that brought us? And it would travel perhaps to the house next door and the house after that. And we used to laugh just because of the joy that that brought us shouting the name of Jesus at the top of our lungs. Have you ever done that? Let me tell you, it is joyful. I do that so often in church. I love to do that in church. In the We will have to get to know the Holy Spirit. And you see, the Holy Spirit teaches us the deep things of God. Now, Jesus has said to us, take your boat, go out into the deep. There are things to know about the deep, and the Holy Spirit knows the things. And let us remember that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Thank you.